Hey folks, I think we're live now, so here we are. Welcome everyone. I am Sean Crisden, voice actor and audiobook narrator, and host for today's discussion. Hello there, and welcome everybody. So today we're discussing uh, recent events and allegations and the elements pertaining to them uh, that have surfaced in the audiobook community and industry showcasing uh, negative behaviors and practices. And specifically, we're looking at concepts of gender disparity, parasocial relationships, and boundaries, uh, and how they apply to us, not just in the audiobook community, but in our society as a whole. We'll also be pulling up and examining and discussing some tools and strategies to navigate all of these uh, deep waters. So this discussion is focused on those broader issues and mechanisms as they affect specifically the romance audiobook industry and the world in general. And our goal here is to promote positive, helpful thought and action on these very topics. So of course, you can blame me. I opened my big mouth on social media through a series of videos that uh, I felt I was obligated to create to add commentary to the events that were happening as these things unfolded. And as a result of that, I wanted to dig deeper with another dialogue uh, with other individuals to talk a little bit more about it and have it occur in a public forum. To that end, let me introduce the guests who uh, have been tricked into appearing here with me. Uh, first, we have Brittany Shabbat. Brittany is the co-host of the Drinking Ink podcast and an avid reader. And by day, she works as an executive director in the nonprofit sector. And by night, she's working on her first novel. So, Brittany, welcome uh, to the conversation with us. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I was really excited when you... Uh mentioned doing this type of forum because I think it is something that needs to happen a lot more often. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. There's a lot of thanks to go around, but thank you for, for participating. I didn't just want to sit here and talk to myself, uh, as is often the case with what I do. Additionally, we have Desiree Ketchum, blogger, author, and award-winning audiobook narrator. Uh, Desiree, welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you so Hello. much for allowing me to participate in this. I'm looking forward to a nice civil discussion where we can really bring to light some of the issues that I think have been shoved in the proverbial closet. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being had. Oh, I, I should probably reword that. <laughs> also, we have TJ London. TJ is the indie author of The Rebels and Redcoats Saga an audiobook executive producer uh, in partnership with Legion Nightfall Studios and the Mohawk rocking mistress of the revolution. Uh, TJ, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is really exciting. I think when I when we were dialoguing, I said, um, I'll be cheering for you in the cheap seats. I guess I got the expensive seats, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, it, it depends. We'll wait until this entire thing is done. Then you can see how that went. <laughs> But thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here for the dialogue and and just to kind of, I don't know, add my perspective. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for joining us. Also, we have Paige. I want to do it. Reisenfeld. Paige Reisenfeld. Paige is a classically classically trained soprano and a stage actor turned sag after audiobook narrator. Paige, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and I hope I have something to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if if not then we'll we'll come up with some kind of task or something for you thank you uh, everybody contributes everybody <laughs> is a part of it we also have uh leanne robert uh leanne is a trauma-informed professional with over 30 years of academic and professional experience working with all human beings leanne's uh, also we used to work together in what seems like another lifetime ago welcome leanne yeah. Thanks so much, Sean. It's great to be here, and I'm excited to be a part of this discussion. Thank you. Oh, super. Thank you. No, I'm 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 glad you all made it. Uh, we also have 
possibly appearing uh, Lacey Laurel, who is another audiobook narrator and producer. Uh, Lacey, Lacey is currently juggling some, some scheduling issues, so she may appear midstream. She may not. If not, we'll just say terrible things about her um, throughout the, the remainder of, of this. But without further ado, and so as not to occupy too much of everyone's precious Saturday time, let's jump into it. So let, let me frame it for us. Um, uh, we'll start general, and then we'll get a little bit of laser focus. Audiobooks. Um, the APA, which is the Audio Publishers Association, reported in 2002 $1.8 billion in audiobook sales. It's a big industry, and it's continuing to grow. And there was another APA survey that found that more than half of adults in the United States have listened to audiobooks at some point. And it doesn't it doesn't indicate whether or not they continued or they fell into listening to one by accident. But um, it's not small fish anymore. And of those audiobooks, uh, the largest and fastest growing genre is romance. And romance is one of them. I, I think sci-fi um, might still take the cake. I'm not, I'm not sure I have to check some of the data on it. But um, for those who are unfamiliar with romance, as a genre of literature, um, romance is described by the Romance Writers of America as being comprised of two main elements. So there's a central love story and an emotionally satisfying and optimistic ending, the, the happily ever after, right? I call it the happy ending sometimes, but in mixed circles, yeah, we got to be careful about that one. So uh, many of these stories um, and audiobooks include elements of human sexuality. Uh, some are more explicit than others, of course, ranging from fade to black in the bedroom to explicitly spicy sexual situations and language. Mwah. Right? Super spicy. So most of our demographics of audiobook listeners and most of the surveys return time and time again that the, that primary demographic of romance audiobooks are women. So let's throw out a, just a very simple place for us to begin. Why do we think that is? Just here in this roundtable, so that we can all come from a common sense of perspective and understanding. Why do we think that the romance genre speaks more to women than to men? And not not to make some great gender divide here as over the diaspora of it, but as we see the data. Um, I'll throw it to you, Brittany. I'll throw it to you first. What do you what do you why do you think that is? I mean, aside from romance being something that's constantly attributed to femininity and and something that is just always been associated if you look back historically women were considered more delicate more frail more fragile and those are all kind of tropes that we see in romance as they kind of build up with this um i also think too with we look at like the rise of feminism and the agency of women wanting to have that excitement of like a fulfilling relationship when maybe that might not necessarily have been the case. I think that's where it maybe began. So. Anyone have thoughts to add to that? I think she makes a very excellent point about historically uh, as a historical author. I mean, we can take it way, way back. I mean, there's romance for women back, 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 like think ladies, Chatterley's lovers, and let's keep going back and back further. So <laughs> romance for women is a thing for a long time. And let it, so to say now, I mean, we're putting a scope on it right now. And I think the pandemic 2020 really like with the focus on audiobooks at that time, I really think happened a lot. And then obviously a lot of the social media interaction around it happened. Um, but it's not a new thing for women. Women per se. And I think some of it is, you know, there is a connection, you know, women connect emotionally when we think of love. It, it's very much about emotion, not that men don't. And I don't want to make light of that because I write a lot of male characters, but women, it's very emotional for them. And maybe that's ingrained in estrogen in us. I'm not sure. And so it's, it's a fulfillment component. You know, you feel satisfaction when you read it. You feel a fulfillment when you read a great romance. You maybe even live out a dream that you've not been able to realize, or, or you bring spark back into your relationship, or you learn how to connect better. There's so many pieces in romance that, that really speak to women, but also can speak to their daily lives and into changing their daily lives. So I think it's, 
I think it's multifaceted. I don't think that it's one thing, but I think it's a historic thing and we need to like remember that. I do agree. You, and that's an interesting point, TJ. Um, do you think that the concept of romance as a genre and those elements that it, it encapsulates, including um, a lot of idealization of, of a relationship and the expectation mm -hmm. of it all works out in the end, right? We, the happy ending, the beats that we find in these stories, it's also an escape from elements uh, in everyday life. But do you think that it's an extension of social programming in terms of how men typically in society, and we're, we're speaking in broad generalizations here, um, are supposed, are not supposed to be, but are generally socially expected to be more stoic, less emotional, um, more reserved. Is that something that you think also plays into why as many men don't read romance as women do on the other end of it? Well, I think that it depends because a lot of the books are focused at women to some degree. I think if we wrote them from a focus where they're relating more to a man, we may a man, we may actually find men who enjoy it. But look at who's predominantly writing romance. There are men who write it, but they're oftentimes writing it directed towards a woman. So I think that there's a little component of that too. And in some of it, um, I think some of it can be a gender based, like what we figure in roles. And I think some of it we have to own that is a nature component of men are stoic in some ways and they do experience love and emotion differently. We are different sexes. So our whole experience is different. Hence why when you write a sex scene from a man's perspective and you write one from a women, woman's, you do your research so that you're experiencing them differently. So romance, mm. it, it, it has to be kind of positioned, you know, for men to become more interested in it. And I do meet men who like romance and I do meet men that enjoy it, but it's always about the approach too. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys think. <laughs> I mean, that's just from an author perspective. Well, that, no, I, I think that as, as a narrator and as um, one of those uh, men people, uh, at least that's what they tell me, I, I think that's fairly accurate. And also in the audio, in terms of audiobooks and and just books in general, uh, we look we have to remember that it is an industry. So there's a component of finding the demographic that you're speaking to and catering to what the focus tested expectations are for that. Because ideally, if you're an author and writing a book, you wish it to be successful. I think that's the general idea. Um, you want it to be well received by the audiences. So to understand how that uh, translates and how you promote it and market it. And it informs your writing uh, as with most other types of creative art or production. You want, you want somebody to receive it on the other end, I would think. So it's, it's, it's an interesting set of nuances that, uh, inform this particular genre and, and all the others, but this one in particular definitely seems to be catered more toward what stereotypically women would want is—is is that what it seems like uh, from the, that general idea for romance? That it feels safer, and that it feels—I'm uh, trying to think of the 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 correct correct way to phrase it. Um, I think one thing I do want to think say is I think women get a lot of freedom through romance. You know, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of. Um, and I don't, for lack of a better way of saying it, historically, we've kind of really suppressed the whole female sexuality historically going back and also how women display themselves and can you enjoy sex and can that be part of your life? Even just education about women's sexuality, about women's health, about perimenopause, about menarche, about all aspects of women's lives and sensuality and sexuality. So in romance, we can kind of go into those places and experiment and live in places that maybe we aren't comfortable with in our own life or won't be comfortable or won't be willing to go. And or we find a freedom through romance to take ourselves to those places that may have been considered not acceptable for women in the 80s, even in the 90s. And then now obviously we have the 2000s and the 2010s. And then certainly going back to my mother's generation in the 50s, what they would, you know. And if we look at romance, it's progressed and changed. What's acceptable in romance novels and what has changed in, in, in what women are looking for. So it's very much, it, it has an empowering component to it. And I think that men haven't had that I, I, not to take away from them, they haven't had to really overcome that. 
women have and are still, as we know, trying to overcome these things. So romance is kind of our space to live and dream and play and experiment and feel safe is a good way, I think, to put it for me. I, agree. I really like how you and put that. I was going to say safety and experiencing things that we don't normally experience in their realm. Or what would it be like if we had a partner who did these things for us right. or acted this way without necessarily mm -hmm. having to experience or without there anything being wrong with our partner in real life? It's, it is a safe way to experience other things in a way that is still ground grounded in the real world. Whereas men tend to gravitate towards fantasy that has potentially has love stories, but it's, there's a sense of, I'm not saying that we don't do romanticy and stuff. We do, but I'm thinking more of contemporary or historical mm -hmm. in this way. There's a safeness to it. I can't speak. Well, I think, but, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, well, in well, historical, well. we kind of live our foremothers. I write historical back in the 1700s. So I'm trying to own respect to their journey and what they weren't able to experience or were, or were trying to, mm. to try to take ownership of our history and not lose where we've gone and where we're coming to. So there's so much space in romance for us to to respect and own that journey too, as well as women. It's a very unifying thing romance can be instead of divisive. And unfortunately it's become very divisive in some ways in which we're gonna talk about, right? But it can be incredibly unifying. And yeah. and Brittany, I know you were gonna say something, so my bad. <laughs> well, I, just, I was gonna say that I also think we have to look at what the stereotypical gender roles look like, yeah. historically speaking, right? Like women have always been expected to be the more emotional, more emotionally connected, uh, Mm -hmm. sex and men have always had to live up to the traditional standard of protector emotionless you know mm -hmm. not you know non-communicative and so you know it's not surprising that romance as a genre is where women tend to congregate when they're looking for fiction and that men don't typically enter these spaces because it's not considered manly or man enough right yeah. like it, it and then that is changing as we've noticed over the course of the last 10 years in the publishing sphere but i think that that's something we have to really take into account when we look at the basis of some of the issues that maybe that we're encountering I agree. that's a solid point and um thinking of that then one of the things that has floated around for a while, and I've been at this 15 years as a male narrator, but I've heard from a lot of other female narrators that I've worked with and, and friends or associates with, that female narrators tend to be paid less than their male counterparts when doing the actual narration work to create an audiobook of these stories, even when we look at the relative experience and reach of those female narrators to their male counterparts. So why do why do we think that is, first of all? I mean, we know, I mean, there, there's obviously some uh, mechanisms historically at, at play that inform this mm. gender wage gap. But specifically when we're talking about romance audiobooks, and we all are in agreement that they are largely geared toward a female audience, why is there no financial incentive or value to our female narrators who are carrying the stories. I think there's multiple. Paige, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw Paige just kind of, oh, so I, I, I want to. I, <laughs> I, I, I think there's, um, I think there's multiple reasons. Um, one, when you think about the audience, I believe and I could be wrong, I don't have data because I didn't look it up, but I believe the majority of it is geared towards cishet women who are looking to feel those tingles, that sense of love, caring, etc., from the male main character. Um, and so that's where the focus is, where it's almost considered a compliment if the, fem the female narrator isn't, you know, annoying or whatever else they say in reviews. If they don't mention us, that's a good thing. Um, but then there's also, um, because that's what they want, um, there are production companies I know that have rate sheets and in the top couple tiers, there are no female narrators listed. And because readers, readers will pay for certain voices, those voices are then given, they can charge what they want. 
right? And authors will pay for it because they believe it's going to sell more. And on the but on the downside, so they can still afford it, well, you have to take a pay cut somewhere. So obviously, it's your other narrator. Um, so I think it's it's one of those balance things where you are selling more with this big name, popular romance narrator at the expense, um, both literally and figuratively, of your female narrator who is actually doing most of the work. And a lot of times it's the administrative work. A lot of the times it's the coordinating. Uh, coordinating is the word. Uh, just And a lot of times it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's just, it's multiple things. The, the, the men are the focus in these heterosexual or even male male which is hugely popular popular among cishet women um they are the ones that the readers want to listen to and so they are the ones who are getting paid more so do you, we identify it as a fiscal issue primarily in the sense that a production has a budget and okay how are we going to divvy up the pot in in this regard Correct. but when we look at the 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 work being done and of course, if someone someone brings greater reach, greater celebrity, um, they are more accomplished or more experienced, regardless of gender uh, or any other um, factors, then they can obviously command a greater rate and supply and demand, so to speak, um, some of our basic economics. But it seems that there's this overwhelming sense that, and I've I've only can't so this is anecdotal for me but i've heard it time and time again and i've been told it time and time again that a lot of our female narrators are, are simply underpaid could it also be a situation of uh those narrators not advocating enough for themselves to for their pay rates or for being willing to accept less for a pay rate for any myriad number of reasons does, does anyone have any experience with that concept or idea or thinking along I do lines. want to add one thing in here back to what Paige said. Just because you put a famous male narrator on your book doesn't mean it's going to sell a lot of copies. And that is a big misnomer. Um, just because you put the biggest name on your book doesn't mean you're going to sell a lot of books. So that really, it's a to some degree, it really is about the book right? It, well, we do make a lot of focus on our male and our female narrators. The truth is it's a book, right? The, ultimately the person is investing in purchasing a book. So if the content isn't interesting to them or the storyline isn't interesting or the genre, they're not going to buy it. I mean, sometimes, you know, I mean, so I think that that is overinflated many a times when we're looking at some of the, the individuals that maybe are charging more money based on name, right? A lot of times it does, but it doesn't always. So I, I do want to add that in, um, just as a as a you know yeah. side point. Desiree, go ahead. No need to raise your hand. Just just jump on in. We're all friends here. Well, I, you know, polite, uh, which probably goes along with what I'm about to say. I do think that mm. speaking historically, um, how women's sexuality and overall demeanor uh, were expected. Uh, to to develop men were more so sons were more so expected to be very direct and you know take what you can get a little bit more aggressive in their approach to what yeah. they want what they need to pay so, and you know and um that could of course be a double-edged sword for a young boy being expected to do that if he's not uncomfortable but at the same time women were expected meek quiet subservient you will take what you are given um historically speaking this is what women were this is the role that women were expected to fill we were expected to stay in this little this little box if you will and men as well in their box you know having an overly emotional or sensitive man was not considered something to be very masculine so there are disparities between both that really hinder you know both sides both genders equally i think but in terms of pay Mm -hmm. um, I do think, speaking for myself, if I had a difficult time asking for more money, absolutely, because I was not taught or mm -hmm. raised as a young woman to be aggressive in my approach with what I felt my worth was. Uh, so I do think that okay. that could certainly be something that uh, goes, it's not the whole reason, but it could certainly be a factor and a component um, as to why there is a 
when there are studies that have proven that that women are less likely to ask for more money and not just as narrators in business in medicine right. what i do right. you know in mm-hmm. in all aspects so this is not just a a problem i mean obviously we're focusing here right but like in general women are less likely to ask for money they're less likely to make as much money they're less likely oh, yeah. to totally be assertive for the, where they are yeah aspect. it's a it's an app. So yeah, you're absolutely right, Desiree. I agree. It's a piece of the pie, um, a big pie, but I think an important one. I definitely absolutely. think an important one. I think part of it too, is that not only are we not trained to ask for more, but I'm going to say it, male narrators getting into romance have it far easier. There are fewer of them. Yeah. They're easier to get cast. They can do less work and get more work immediately. And if I say no, there are 500 of me. You know what I mean? Like, yes, we all have a unique voice, et cetera. But if I say like, hey, no, I'm not okay with this. I want to be paid what he's being paid. They're going to be like, cool. We're going to go find somebody who sounds similar enough to you, who is willing to accept less because there are more of you. And at least in the social media world, your name is not the one selling books, at least in terms of marketing. So there is no impetus for me to ask for more because I could either get paid what they're asking, what they're giving me, or I can get zero because they're not going to hire me and I can stand my ground, but then I'm not working. So it's kind of this, um, it's, it's a catch 22. I can't, I'm like, I can either accept the lower rate or not work at all. Well, and that's what I wanted to, I, I wanted to make sure to point out is we're looking at something that's a gig economy, right? Like you are only paid for the job that you're currently doing and the jobs that you have lined up. While I haven't been an audiobook narrator for a, a, about five to six years in my early 20s, I was a freelance musician and I was the only chick on the street in my town doing it and making sure that I was paid and treated fairly as to the the, the guys was a challenge. And I was grateful enough to have men in that space who welcomed me and mentored me. But that's something that we don't see in the audiobook space. There is um, a very low level of entry cost to entry, really, to becoming an audiobook narrator. And so I think when we look at specifically new narrators, specifically new female narrators entering this, entering this space, what is industry standard versus what should I be asking for versus what should I be talking about? Who should I be talking to? This is all stuff that's kind of held, held behind that Wizard of Oz screen as like secret knowledge. And really, women are just kind of left to sort of, well, figure it out. And so that's where I think we fall, fall into what you're talking about, Paige, is like, well, I can either take the job or I cannot work. And I want to work because I'm a freelancer and I want to build my name for myself. So I'm willing to take less money in the hopes that it'll pay off later down the road. I think there's an interesting perspective here from the author. And when you're hiring narrators, um, I'm very fortunate now as I'm an executive producer in partnership with a production company. But one of the things is money is money, right? You have so much of it when you come to the table. And you want to get your audiobook produced and you you only have so much, right? And then Audible is going to take their cut. I'm going to pay all of you per finished hour. And then I'm going to be waiting 10 years to pay back my audiobook. And so you're in this position of you want all these things. And but here's what you have as a resource, right? So then you're put in a position where you've got to make the best decisions you can because of your limited, your finite resources, right? So then you're like, okay, I can have this male narrator, I can have this female, and hopefully I get the marketing that I want and I can start to sell more so that maybe on my next audiobook, when I finally break even, after Audible gets their cut, after I pay my production company, after I pay my per finished hour, then maybe I can go get the narrators that I really do want or that I can pay for or I ha- or I can do these things. So unfortunately as an indie author, that's a reality. I am in the red on all five of uh, on all four of my audiobooks. Um, it is what it is. So unfortunately when I look at cost and I'm like this person, this person, this person, this person, I want all these things, but I'm also in a bind. You know what I mean? And that's a component of this that affects you guys so drastically because if I'm not making money, you're not going to make any money. You know what I mean? If I can't pay you, how can you have a job? And so there's a there's a whole 
another layer to the pay component that is not controlled by any of us. Mm -hmm. It's about the money coming back to authors to be able to put back into the system as independents. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is, is a lot of it is juxtaposed against business forces uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of how do we stay in the black? How is this fiscally solvent to produce an audiobook? To, to make it work. And then that trickles down through a, a whole series of <laughs> other systems and ideas and learned behaviors and biases that we, we see in every aspect of any industry that can be divided amongst gender or social class or your cultural ideology of, of what you think you deserve, who you think you, who you think and believe you are. I, I even as a male narrator, I encounter that pretty often for myself outside of the crushing specter of self-doubt that rides my shoulders. It's always the, ah, I, I guess I should try to raise my rates. And then you try to get some sort of canvas or, or a benchmark of, well, what's going on in the industry and what have I accomplished and what have I done? Even with my, my cis male privilege in that regard, uh, I still have other forces that I'm battling against. So it's, it's a challenging uh, <laughs> dragon to slay. I think uh, in terms of helping to resolve it, one thing is education. You know, mm -hmm. narrators of all genders need to know, well, what's your worth? What is the industry support, right? So what is the market willing to bear uh, as, as it holds out? Um, I think that's a, an important part of it. Um, and especially for female narrators that enter the space, not to diminish their value and to come and say, look, well, this is what my time and my effort and my training and my knowledge and my skill is worth. And will the market bear that? So is the market willing to, to bear that for you? I, I think that's, that's, I mean, that's a whole other deep discussion in and of itself that, that we could go on. Um, any other suggestions for steps toward remedying that or to help to alleviate it in some way? Oh, I don't I just personally speaking, when we had this similar issue when I was on the musician, there was um the there was a couple of bars that were willing that were not willing to pay the standard rate. And so a bunch of us got together and talked about maybe having a union. Now I don't know how feasible that is in terms of the audiobook space, but I know that there are protections like SAG AFTRA. Like, why aren't we connecting these voice actors? Because that is what you're doing. You're narrating and you are acting these stories. Why is there no, not more regulation in terms of like, in order to, for X book, you have to be registered with a licensed body or at least have some form of across the board space where you can go for information am i being underpaid am i being taken advantage of if you don't have any industry friends or people you can ask well the thing about audiobooks is that you can be represented by the union but there is no global rule one i can accept non-union mm -hmm. work as mm -hmm. a union narrator mm -hmm. because all of the contracts with the various publishers and production companies are different um they're so they can't they won't agree to these same standards. Uh, the union is consistently pushing for new things, for changes, and there are times where the companies just say, no, it's not viable. And so we have to kind of, they kind of have to like finagle and take what they can get um, because also, you know, gig economy, right? It's like, like, all right, well, you agree to that. Well, we'll do the thing. Well, that's fine. Um, but then things slip through the cracks and they can't guarantee us a minimum base rate unless somebody is signed with it. Uh, so they can't require, although I think some production houses do offer just a straight rate. And they're a like, this rate. is what this there is are. paying. Um, like, I And there are some production houses that actually will delineate in black and white when they hire their narrators. This is what we pay our narrators. So it doesn't matter what gender you are, what you're bringing. This is the rate that's paid. So mm -hmm. there is some element of parity that's, that's being ushered in. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out. I, I think that's a good place to start as well. Um, Can I play a little devil's advocate here? Absolutely. We love I it. I think we need to go after book platforms um, and start getting authors paid more money. 
um, and getting more than only their, they, we can't set our prices on Audible. Sorry to call it Audible, but it's a thing. Um, we don't get to set our book prices. They get to put them on sale mm -hmm. when they want to. Um, they get to control, you know, a lot of it. If I, if I can make more money off of it, I can, you know, support audiobooks and support you and more of that equality. I don't have a union. There's nobody who protects me as an right. indie. I I protect me and hopefully my production company or as for me, my business partner is together protecting me. Mm -hmm. So you get jobs through authors. Authors get paid through platforms. So there not only do we obviously need to reach in that direction, but again the system is propped up by the by the work. And if the work worker isn't getting paid, you can't continue to feed the system. That just is what it is. Oh, 100%. Um, so I yeah. think that there needs to be not only these things over here, but these things over here. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. women as authors, not just women as narrators. It's both of us mm -hmm. that are lose losing here. Um, yeah. And and we need to think about it in that vein too as well. Because trust me, when I get a male narrator that I want to work with that's giving me this astronomical price, and then I have my female there, and I'm like, oh. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't love those moments either. Um, and then I look at my budget and I look at what's going to come from Audible and I look at my record and, you know, it just it is. Oh, I agree. Um, so I, I have authors who are um, who won't sell on Audible now. They're only doing it through every other website because they get more. And well, they're like, no, I'm not. They're just doing it direct. Even but then, they're they still taking a butt. Even those are still taking quite a bit. So a lot of us right. then are having to go to our own sites like and find our own all. ways yeah. to prevent pirating and all these different yeah. things. Oh, yeah. So this is much bigger than just one. It, it's it's multifaceted, but in the end, it's 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 all it's women authors and women narrators are being I think very affected by this too. Yeah. Well, they they. Dis are disproportionately affected due to the disparity in the Correct. wages and the yes. earnings that are happening. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's making it a much bigger issue. I mean, all everyone, all authors and all narrators are affected of, as we're Correct. all ground up in the machine, right. of course. But right. We see it, it, it dispro disproportionately affecting other groups, especially women uh, and female narrators. Um, that I do. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say I do think it's it affects. Part of it is this perceived audience that we have, like this is all happening on social media, right? So I'm going to pull it back to social media. And what Brittany was talking about with parasocial relationships is that, I mean, TJ, you said that the names don't necessarily sell books, but that's not what indie and new authors are seeing on social media. They're seeing people go, oh, I am going to buy that because that person's name on it. And so the the now the suggestion is in their mind, like, oh, I have to have this narrator because that's going to mm -hmm. sell me books and make me money. So it's this, um, and you see... Um, narrators on there, newer and older, who are like, yes, if you put me on it, then my name, my face, my voice is going to sell this book. And that may or may not be accurate. But then they're developing these relationships with their audience, their readers who want to support them, their listeners who want to support them. And that ties into the problem that kind of started this whole discussion is right. the socialness that men can do these things more easily, get paid more, um, et cetera. And it's fed, it's the cycle in this system. And anyway, I'm- No, that, that's no. perfect. <laughs> great <laughs> point. And you're it's absolutely great point. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Because when, and anytime there's an element of, of celebrity or authority, right? There, there, there becomes a power differential. And in the age of social media that we're in right now, the world's a smaller place. So, uh, things are more visible and accessible. And even, you know, I couldn't think of 20 years ago DMing, not that it was even a thing then, sending a letter, writing a pen and paper letter to Brad Pitt or Denzel Washington and expecting to get a response, right? To say that I'm such a big fan, I'm going to I'm gonna write these actors or, or actresses and, and expect them to respond outside of maybe a form letter you get a year and a half later from their PR person or something. But now, you know, when you have a, a degree of celebrity or even minor celebrity, anybody can just slide on into your DMs and expect to 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 contact you. And so we're 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 moving into a new era of these types of parasocial relationships. And that's something that people bring up a lot. And I I want to actually I want to toss that to Leanne. So Leanne, clinically, can you describe what a parasocial relationship is? just so that we 
have a, a, a solid definition of it for ourselves and, and for the viewers and listeners here? Sure. So in this realm, it would be um, akin to a relationship that is perceived between someone. And as you mentioned, Sean, where there is a power differential. Um, and so the degree of relationship in terms of the closeness of one to another is largely based on perception, um, as well as, as we know, the reason we're having this discussion because of other things that may also be asked of someone in a parasocial relationship. Um, so I'm not sure if I exactly defined what you wanted me to. <laughs> no, no, you did. I, I, I mean, that's at least my understanding of it is that um, it's often relationships or interactions that form where there is a power differential and yes. often described as the individual at the top of that uh, hierarchy, if you will, uh, oftentimes may have no idea that the other person exists or exudes that amount of uh, interest in them. Uh, we usually see it played out, I believe, in celebrity. So there's some star and you can't believe, oh, I love Elvis. And Elvis has no idea who you are. You <laughs> rip your clothes off, throw them on the stage when you see him or right. just thought of Elvis and you send Elvis love letters and flowers. Um, that's an extreme case of course uh, as elvis is dead that would probably be highly inappropriate even right now but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's so much really I, just, there. I just think sean would have been big for beatlemania you know <laughs> I, I actually you know, had to look up I this an, term i actually had to look up this term when it went mm -hmm. through our email because I, I i hadn't associated this term with this you know behavior i guess you're talking about so leon thank you for the the more feed like platform absolutely yeah, yeah. and the other thing don't... is too if if i may guys the other thing is it could be a parasocial relationship is not inadvertently negative it can actually be a really positive sure. so for example say we have a celebrity who as we know a lot of celebrities nowadays are into wellness and have you know different websites or different products even to promote health and wellness and that's something that because you're a follower of this person and you have this can you know perceived relationship that you then do things to improve yourself but then we have the flip side where it could be somebody um, who is very famous who may reach back or it could be somebody who is social media famous who reaches back to someone and uses that person's um, likening of them to extort or to exploit or to different to do different things that could negatively impact a person. So the relationship in and of itself isn't necessarily gonna, I, I can't say 100%, it's always a negative thing because there can be positives to it. So it really depends on the specific situation and the perception of the person on the receiving end, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and if the person who is the we'll we'll just call them the celebrity, I, I guess at the at the upper end of that, they can utilize their position or power or the perception of their position or power to manipulate uh, the other person on the on the receiving end or to enter into realms of abuse or harassment even uh that to me that's what it sounds like that's when it becomes problematic that it's uh begins to dip into negative territory so is that what you're what you're saying Leah? i don't want to throw words in your mouth to no that, absolutely that seems like absolutely I th absolutely I think I think it for me um, as a new author, and I'm an indie niche author, so most people don't know American Revolutionary War historical fiction author, right? Um, and when I first made my segue from just physical books into audiobooks, um, it it was a real shock to me to have people suddenly DM me that I I didn't know who read my books and or listened to my work and were suddenly dialoguing with me and you know talking to me about different aspects of their life and and these were people I I did not know now, obviously on a very small scale I'm sure you guys have dealt with probably much on a larger scale it was a very like 
shocking thing for me and understand that it happened in 2020 when a lot of people were stuck behind their computers and social media really boomed and i feel like the audio business really had had like its its heyday you know at that time so people were really engaged and interacting there was a lot of stuff going on on twitter there was a lot of dialogue there was a lot of feeding into the system um and it was my first time i'd ever experienced that and it was almost kind of shocking for me and um and it, and and at times felt very intrusive in some ways too. And I, I think that it it can be. I can't even imagine when you're getting hundreds of these and you're a gentleman or a female narrator and you've got people who are saying all kinds of things because they've listened to something. How shocking and unsettling and almost you know a little intrusive it could feel. Um, and I struggled with it immensely when these types of things happened and didn't know how to respond as I have my own mental health issues. So um, I'd be curious to hear what you know you guys have to say in, in the vein of that. I can feel that one um, easily too, as a cis male and in, in this space um, and an introvert on top of that. I am um, too. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think most of us tend to be, we're, uh, we, we put on a good show, but then right. <laughs> yeah. we need to recover in the safety of our crypts. Um, when I like interacting with fans, uh, I and I do, a lot, I do not just audiobook work, but I do video games and um, commercials and uh, animation and things. So I, I have various fandoms that intersect in different ways. In the realm of romance audiobooks, um, I am DM'd daily, easily, um, multiple times a day. And, and I, I have some fans that I've developed relationships with and that I know them by name and they, they'll ping me. I know some elements of their life. But for me, it's there's different elements of how I handle that. One is that I need to establish a sense of boundary and that I am a human being and I, I feel and think and emote like a human. I have a life outside of what they perceive me to be, my hashtag best life on social media or the characters I've played or portrayed. And in romance audiobooks, a lot of them are super spicy. So there's an element of sexuality that is intrinsic to that. So part of that comes with the territory. So I've accepted that, that of course I'm playing into human kink and taboo and fantasy as I'm portraying these characterizations in audio. And I expect that people oftentimes will be unable to distinguish between the reality and the craft of it. To think that, oh yeah, you you are you must be a, a BDSM billionaire who just comes along and and or you know some biker who just all you do is well, eh, I'm pretty lazy. So, um, navigating that for me is a sense of establishing boundaries. And also being sure to not to cater extensively to the fantasy. And people say, hey, say you get somebody will DM you and say, can you say this? Or they'll see you at a convention and, oh, say this line from this character. Okay. Yeah. You know, there, there are elements, but there comes a point where you have to decide. And, and I imagine it's for the individual, objectively and subjectively speaking, that you have to decide how far does this go? Do I continue to, to play this game? to appeal to an audience or to appeal to a fandom? Or do I have to say, yes, let's all acknowledge that it's a fandom. I've done these characters. I can provide some of these elements for you, but also there's a line at which we accept that it is not reality and that morally and ethically, me as a professional, <laughs> I attempt not to cross those lines. Um, that's something that all of the events that came up in, in Romance Landia recently had me reconsidering even for myself to, to say, well, have I done anything that I felt um, encouraged that type of interaction or shifted a relationship as a parasocial relationship into a more negative light? So that's something I'm constantly challenged with myself. I mean, I'm, I'd be curious to hear you know, most of us here have some degree of celebrity or authority uh, in our career, um, how that's affected the rest of you as well and how you've dealt with it. Well, for, for me, um, I, I can't say that I would have the same level given that the demographic is primarily heterosexual female listeners. So there is a lot of focus on the fantasy of being the male. So I 
don't would not expect to have the same level of forgive for the lack of a better term worship again lack of a better term um as you know someone like yourself sean as a male narrator portraying voicing that um male that that fantasy of that that male figure in that space however i do still take it upon myself to have that responsibility of that of having a boundary uh so the way i've always thought of it is the line for me is the threshold between my booth and the rest of my house so mm -hmm. my booth i'm empty i'm a vessel as i like to call it i'm not me when i'm voicing these characters i'm these characters i am the author and their words and the the, the persona that is, that has been created in this world that has been created outside of it i'm just i'm just me and for, for me it's very important to distinguish between the two worlds and so of course what you're going to see or hear in an audiobook is hopefully someone who's pretty eloquent and uh well versed and bringing the badass or sweet or whatever type of fmc that the author has uh gifted via visual word but what they're not seeing is desiree sitting in her pajamas with cheeto dust in her hair playing god of war for 24 hours straight you know <laughs> that's where the line is so for me i don't it's it's important for me not to carry that over into my everyday life and even in my interactions with fans or listeners of course there's going to be a professional um you know rapport going on there but i'm just me i'm not here to perpetuate a fantasy um i'm not here to uh play act i'm here to be a professional and to conduct myself as such and i think um shiloh she's another wonderful narrator she said it best where uh we're not the fantasy we are the guide of the fantasy we are guiding you along the fantasy we're going along with this with with the fantasy with you but we are not the fantasy itself so hopefully that added some modicum of value to the conversation i'm sorry i was mute there i want to add something onto what you're saying because it's very important you are you're saying that you're the vessel for it and oftentimes i think it happens a lot with male narrators where they become the vessel for the character so they become associated with the character and and we saw in some of the recent things with in romance landia that so much of of a narrator can be associated with a person's work so that it really ends up really having a drastic effect on that work too. For some reason with women, we we tend to not see that as much where the female becomes so associated with the female character and that it's really, you know, can have a downstream effect on the author and the work and this and all those different things. But we do see it with men. And, you know, we have some of these issues that happen and then the fans have so associated that character with this particular male narrator. And then we see that downstream effect that can happen. Um, yeah, I, know that, I do that's, think that comes mm -hmm. to, I do think that comes down to the responsibility of the performer to be able to separate themselves from, you know, them as a human being and who they are and the character that they're portraying. I do, do think they, it's, yeah. very, it's, it's a very fine line to walk it between, is. you know, imbibing, allowing this character to be a part of your being and then allowing space for them when it's appropriate which would be for me always in the booth but it's up to us i think as performers to draw that line and hold it firm um between you know the fantasy and the reality of who we are Paige, you I, had something to add there or well, Brittany, Brittany? brittany's been Both trying to speak can we let her go i just want to <laughs> say i want to i want to make sure we're also holding the community accountable because this has been something that has been i've seen an increase of in the last two years with respect to behavior from community members as well right like yes there is the responsibility of the narrator or the voice of creating right. and establishing those boundaries but as we've seen with other female influencers with inappropriate Absolutely. behavior rallying i mean we've all seen mm -hmm. the thirst trap where everyone's going hey book talk where are you i mean yeah 
This right, is a, right. a behavior that is being encouraged by the community as well. And I think that it's really important that we also hold ourselves accountable as consumers to call out this behavior and or and and make sure that we're not engaging in it as well because it's it's a we have to make sure this isn't a, a give and take relationship right like the narrator provides us with a service provides us with this fantasy and as the readers we get to enjoy that but it's also our responsibility as readers and consumers of this content to respect those boundaries and but to does, not go further but does just the narrator provide you with the fantasy isn't it also well, the, 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 i mean the, the words, the words sure. that are being delivered so it's the symbiosis of the two and i think that yes. this is often a problem that gets lost as an i'm an author i'm not an author narrator so i'm speaking from my corner of the room where oftentimes the author feels lost in this relationship where it becomes all about the narrator and the character and that person gets separated so that when events like this happen and someone is so associated with your work and you're completely removed you paid this person to sure. do a job now it's all about fan perception fan behavior and this narrator and you're like whoa my sales have now been affected like people are talking about my work and you're an afterthought but it's your work it's an audiobook and i'm sitting here going are we in kansas anymore have people lost their minds these are books these are people's art before they even come to you so i think that there's a there's a there's another component of this that we need to own on that there's another person who gets affected by these behaviors on top of the narrator it's the author too I, sure I think part of the issue is that when it becomes, when that boundary is no longer respected and established by either side, and then the narrator, um, I'm sure there are female narrators who have done it too, but I've seen it most often with male narrators, they start feeding into it, right? And yes. now they're not doing it as a character. Now they're doing it as themselves. And that is the problem. You were, you're like, oh, you know, so-and-so's name, you as the person, I want you to say something and I'll, I'll say mm -hmm. good girl mm -hmm. for me. Now right. you're not the character. Now you are sexualizing this person. And it's up right. to the narrator to be like, yep. hey, that's not okay. I'm a person. But you see because it feeds the ego it feeds that dopamine that they encourage it you see a lot of male voice actors and some again some female um, especially like anonymous sex workers and that's fine i'm not knocking it that's what they're there for that is their boundary and that's Correct. cool Correct. but when it affects authors co-narrators production companies publishing houses you have to be responsible and respectful enough to say hey no I'm not doing this. Like we just did a Kickstarter, my partner and I, who also narrates, and we talked about doing messages. And my partner, PJ, was like, hey, no, I'm, I'll do messages as a character, but I am not sending personal messages as PJ Freeborn. I will do, I will do a message if it's a line from a book, but me as PJ Freeborn is not going to say anything unless it's like, thanks for supporting the Kickstarter, but it's not going to be anything sexual, anything suggestive, anything like that, because I am this person and they are backing the author and the audiobook, And those are different. The problem becomes when say, for example, I go to Sean, I'm like, Hey, Sean, you know, say whatever line. And but I want Sean to say it. I don't want Sean as this character to say it. I want Sean to say it. And it's Sean's responsibility to say no. And it's my responsibility to say that's not okay because this is a person. So right. it's this like combination of things. And it's actually led to me interviewing every narrator I hire. Like I interview, not only do I do an audition, but I interview everyone because I want to get a sense of what their perception of what their role is who they are as individuals and how they're going to represent my work because i know that this symbiosis and this kind of confusion that seems to happen in these parasocial behaviors affects my work and then could affect my bottom line down the line several years from now in which we are talking about that's happened in romance landia and it, it becomes it become well fans are amazing and i don't want to say that they're not but this can happen in this community and the impact is widespread which we've seen and we know and so but people have to take ownership for their part in it it's it's we get here because certain things happen you know and Brittany, you said it brilliant there does have to be some real responsibility taken on these people too as well yeah i think the as the entire community everyone's correct we have to reinforce what the expectations are. 
what the boundaries are, because as we allow things to happen and perpetuate or promote them, which which happens, and it's I don't think it will ever actually happen, because as a community we are made of so many different voices and people and ideas. It, but it it has to come from a predominant steering of of the the vessel to say that's not okay. And it, it's one of the reasons why we're having this discussion anyway, because a lot of times these things aren't talked about or they're obfuscated and covered or or sometimes um, parts of the community want to silence that and don't want to talk about it or to under mm -hmm. even to have a discussion to understand, well, why do you think this is problematic? Rather, they just want to shut it down uh, rather than just having a conversation to say, I still disagree with you or oh, maybe that's a, a point. You know, so I, I always talk about the dialectic to try to to dig into the truth of things from different perspectives. So that's why we're talking about it right now to hear it. Because even as a, as a narrator, I've done messages for people. And if they say, hey, Sean, do this, I say, well, let's look at a character. But there's even a Sean Crisden character for me that uh, if you look at my TikTok videos, I, I, I am not a social media guy. Um, there There's this sort of, uh, I don't want to say suave, but th there's a conversation <laughs> of me that delivers ridiculous poetry or it, it's okay. things. So there's even a, a characterization of myself that I promote that way. So I do that, but it's always for me to, to delicately understand when do I pierce that boundary and have gone too far or have provided um, too much of myself as Sean Crisden, the human being, to a person um, where they feel that suddenly there's more in, a in the relationship than is there or fuel for something for them, as opposed to, oh, I'm Dreo from Ac the book Acrobat, or which is a popular one, or any of the other books, these characters and doing voices. So it's a delicate balancing act for me, as I imagine for other talent too, who, who want to kind of say, well, how do I appeal to my fan base? How do I remain viable and accessible enough and still relevant in this ever-changing world. I mean, we have the advent of AI and so many other, there's a million narrators or other voice talent people can listen to. So how do we, how do we stay on the edge of that? So it's, it's all <laughs> this big bundle of crap that we have to deal with to figure out what works, what doesn't, what's healthy what isn't and what becomes problematic and it, for me i feel like it's this constant ebb and flow of kind of teasing the edge of that sean can i throw in a really scary word professionalism it's ah! not it's not just a verb i mean it's not just an adjective it is a verb and it is a noun professional you can be professional you can be professionalism and you can make a choice to be professional and look it up it's and there are there are things that we do that are professional and if you use those tools and you use them every day in your work life and then in and and when you deal with people you'll you can be okay you know what I mean? we can navigate this world these are not, these are not i mean these are not new concepts and unfortunately like professionalism just went out the window and even more so in 2020 and sometimes you just have to maintain a professional persona and in the face of you can't control how people come to you, but you can control your own, you know, behavior and how you respond and how you react. And I don't know, it just seems like such a naughty word. You know, what would, what is the professional thing to do here? If you're getting DM by somebody mm -hmm. and they're saying inappropriate things to them, I'm sorry, that's inappropriate. Thank you very much. Block, you know, you're, this is a lovely person. Thank you for reaching out to me. I'm glad you liked the work I did on this. That's awesome, you know, and maybe you have a nice relationship. But hey, I think author. that's, I think the idea of professionalism, not to cut you off, TJ. Yeah, um, no, no. I, I think it's more subjective though. And I think it's, there's there's no hard, fast definition of what everyone would feel like. This is professional behavior. I'll make sure that I... Well, how would you like to be treated, what, I guess, is what your mom right. says. <laughs> well, well, the golden rule typically is is paramount in most understandings of an interaction say well would i like that but some yeah. people would so we can't necessarily default to that in my opinion as a way to gauge if it crosses a, a boundary or if it's ethical or moral because those things start to become more amorphous 
and we we start to see them subjective to the individual or the circumstance. Mm -hmm. So it's it's difficult for me at least to think, well, let's just keep it professional. My what I believe is professional is probably very different from what Brittany thinks is professional. It might be different from what Leanne thinks is professional. Um, so that it, it's challenging still to me to, to, to think of it that way. I think for me, it's more, there are certain things like in my day-to-day -day job that just what you would do in the work environment. Do you know what I'm saying? I guess I try to, and you're right. Everyone's values are different. Everybody measures different things, you know, um, and, and we're all freelancers, right? We're freelance authors. A lot of these are freelance production companies, you know, freelance narrators. So everybody's vacillating and functioning in different levels of professionalism, I guess, in, in, in those, there's no standards, set, right? So yeah, I understand that. Fair. I love playing devil's advocate too. So. And that's okay, right? Like that's the whole point of this, you know, but I mean, and you can't ask a fans or fandom or people in those, in those situations to always be professional, right? Like that's a different situation. Um, but, but then we do also have to own our behavior after the fact, right? Um, Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, well, that's, we, that's always a, ooh, it's a big one for me. And that, you know, people talk about cancel culture and, and these elements oh. of things. And, oh, the consequences of your actions. There we go. Now I look we're at it. I look it. at it in three. I, I think of it in three ways, because, again, and, and this is I'm not trying to hijack our conversation, but just to kind of frame it. Right. Uh, I look at it as one is intention. So what was the intention of the action or the effort? Right. So we have to we have to frame that some kind of way. Two is the reception. How is it received by that audience? How is it? And then once we understand that reception based against that intention, what is then the reaction of the person who is creating the action or the or that effort or intention to say, do you do you double down on it? Do you learn from an experience if some if if the reception is one that's like, oh, that wasn't well received. Oh, you think I'm a terrible racist <laughs> or whatever the case may be. So now what is your reaction to understanding this new information. And I like to look at all the things that happen in that regard. Uh, uh, have you learned? Have you grown? Because we all make terrible mistakes. I've made horrible mistakes. And do we gr try to grow and evolve positively as people from it? Or do we just stick our head in the sand and ignore it? Or do we double down, triple down on, on something that we're seeing overwhelmingly isn't going so well? Um, that's how I like to, to try to, the lens I use to, to at least try to find a semblance of direction with a lot of the things that go on because the world's big and can be confusing and scary. Somebody said professionalism and I jumped. Um, but that's, that's what I, I like to think about it. But for the individuals on the other end, no matter what we think for our perception, if you feel that you were a victim of abuse or or um, harassment or, or predation, someone preyed on you and you've, you've, you're not even sure and you're not, but you don't know where to go. You know, a lot of people sometimes don't have a benchmark for even how to talk about it. So what came out of the community was, hey, well, let's talk about rain. You know, when I started this whole thing, it was, well, we need a charity to donate to because there are people who are potentially victims in this whole situation. So let's, let's care for the victims. Let's hear what they have to say and listen to them. And we donated to to Rain, which is um, Rain.org, um, which is the U.S.'s largest um, sexual abuse and sexual violence network. Uh, which I often encourage people. So if you think you've been a victim of abuse, you can you can definitely contact them. They also have a um, telephone hotline, bada bing, bada boom, um, that folks can call which is confidential and you can find help resources and help you to work your way through those things as well. Because no matter what we say, we're not professionals, say for Leanne, um, and professional clinicians who can um, really understand everything. And that's the same reason why I made the every voice, da -da -da, you know, um, <laughs> let every voice be heard, let every story be told. And I donated 50% of all the proceeds from that to rain um, which that's available on my website. I'm not, I'm not hawking wares here. This is our conversation. But um, so that people can understand that there's these various perceptions of what's going on and there are all these subjective experiences so that you can find help if you need to find help or you feel that that's been an issue for you. Um, thinking of 
wrapping it up in terms of this this discussion is great and i want to keep going but i want to respect everybody's free saturday time um what other tools for positive change regarding the way that these relationships work as authors as narrators as talent just as any degree of celebrity um do you think can be utilized like if you could sum it up I'm going to I'm going to poke you Leanne first as our resident clinician um that if you could find a way to sort of summarize well this things people should do should be to seek help or how do I identify this or what should I do if I feel like I am falling into becoming a victim in a parasocial relationship that I is out of my control uh, what would your advice to someone be? So one of the biggest things I would say, Sean, is for an individual not to doubt themselves. Because as you brought up, I mean, so much of this is subjective. But what often happens is folks who end up in, in these relationships on the end of being exploited or feeling abused or being abused, oftentimes will doubt themselves because of perception, because of other people's perception, because of public perception, because of things that folks on, on this have mentioned in terms of, you know, um, people holding themselves accountable. So I think the biggest thing is if, if someone feels that way, they need to acknowledge that and whatever feels comfortable for them in terms of reaching out for help would be most important. But the biggest thing would be to accept and not deny how you feel as an individual in that situation. Because oftentimes people will blame themselves, especially if they've initiated the contact, which 99 out of 100 times, that's the case. Um, and so just to, to acknowledge that how a person is feeling is not okay, and that it is okay to reach out for help. I appreciate that. That's that's helpful to, to know. Yeah. Um, what about on the other end? What do you think about if I suddenly felt or, you know, if Desiree or Paige or, or, or Brittany or TJ, you know, you're someone re has reached out to them and they feel like they're moving into a direction that is uncomfortable. Right. So that uh, productive discomfort is like we, we sometimes talk about. We're like, well, I'm uncomfortable. What should I do to make sure this ends positively? Um, it doesn't what always, happen right? Then? Unfortunately, yeah. sometimes it's a matter of, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're done conversing here, unfortunately. Um, and it's true. I mean, you always true. You want, you always want to. I, I know with every interaction I've ended up, I try to always be positive in them, but sometimes it's, it, it does have to go that way. Okay. You know, this is this is where this ends right here. But trying to be respectful, um, but it it it's a it can be a daunting thing. But then, like Leanne said, it can also be a positive thing. You know, you I've ended up in some situations where I made some really lovely friends out of you know a couple of these situations too as well. So I think you have to kind of just be smart and just kind of you know thoughtful through the process. And because I think it's a process of working through it. Leanne, I don't know how what you think about that, but. Yeah, and actually, TJ, what you had said earlier, too, um, has come into mind in the sense of drawing the boundary and saying, you know, this is not appropriate. And if it if it doesn't cease, going to that end of blocking that person or doing what you have to do, but mm -hmm. just maintaining that boundary and whatever professionalism looks like for you as an individual. Yeah. Um, because unfortunately, it is subjective. Yeah, true. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you. I want to take the last couple of minutes we have here and um, open up some other comments from some of the viewers um, who are here. And uh, I liked this one coming in from RATS or RITS, which was, uh, so creators and authors also need to reinforce their boundaries without fear of cancellation. And fans, if a creator or author is asking for something to be closer, let someone know and block. So I think that's that's solid advice. You know, like we all have the power to just block. <laughs> um, and when something goes too far, and I I, I think 100% that is a solid recommendation and, and method to say, you know what, I'm not expending any more energy on this. 
um, to deal or to negotiate or try to seem like it's it's all hunky dory. Um, and let's see what let's see what else we have. Sean, you know, I gotta add something here. I'm sorry to add in, but no, no, there is also it, a it. component of cancellation is real and mm -hmm. it can happen if you sometimes in 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 respect, but there can be groups and fan bases and people and people in the community who you say the wrong thing and you're now in persona non grata and it's real and they're not afraid to do it. Um, in my professional career, not in this career, I was canceled. So I do understand what that is like and it is traumatizing. And so if you've mm -hmm. been there before and there's this fear and fear that people will put not nice reviews on your books or they'll return all your books because they understand how these things affect you as because we have very savvy people unfortunately and fortunately it's a good thing right um it's real it's a fear and it happens and i know that there are a lot of people who can talk about it and that's some of how we got here right that fear and one of the things we really haven't gone there to as well and that's a responsibility that these individuals need to own and why would they until somebody calls them out on it who helps these people who are afraid of being canceled. So. No, that 100%. Uh, even uh, we had multiply.creator said, yes, we need to treat people behind the screen with respect more often than overstep boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, as that. a part of a community. Yeah, please. Um, I think we're very technologically advanced as of right now, but I do think that socially we're still understanding fine tuning the nuance of communicating with each other via these you know screens so when you're sitting next to somebody or in a group and you say something offhanded and it doesn't get taken well you can feel the energy shift and you can tell oh i did i i shouldn't have said that that felt icky you can feel it without words being spoken however with this mm -hmm. barrier uh, it makes it very difficult and also it makes it much easier for lines to become blurred to not see the person on the other side of that screen as a human being with a life and um, with with feelings or with intentions, whether they be negative or positive intentions. So I do think from both sides, I think we need to be very clear and concise with our words about how these boundaries need to be laid out. I do think we need to go above and beyond in with our communication, again, from both sides about what we're expecting, what is expected and what is acceptable between, you know, whatever parties are involved. I also want to bring up something that uh, I talk about a little bit on the, we did an episode on my podcast called Predation in the Romance Space, where we kind of dug deeper a little bit into this. Um, and one of the things that myself personally that I find really frustrating is that, uh, that I would like to see more of is, is men in the romance space speaking up more and, and taking up that space because inherently unfortunately the society that we live in men tend to be taken more seriously than women do women are often seen as oh we are just bitching or we're just complaining or we're just causing drama or we're being toxic whereas when a man comes forward and says yo this actually is really not okay this is really yes. problematic yes <laughs> people listen and so there are lots of, and I'm not talking about just narrators, I'm talking about large book talk influencers who have made massive platforms through interacting genuinely in the book talk space. But whenever something of this nature occurs where there is clearly a right and a wrong set of behaviors, they never say anything and they get to continue on their happy way, whereas the women in the space are constantly affected. Yes. I was shocked that I was one of the first male narrators to make a stink about what had happened and, and what we're talking about now. And I, I'm slow and I'm not social media savvy much. I social media verse, I call it. And the, that I the fact that I made a video and everybody said, yes, you're you're I haven't heard anybody else speak up about this was shocking to me. And it also helped to open my eyes to say, why are none of my male peers talking about how this is not OK? Yes. That yes. this is not something that can be allowed to happen. I didn't think I was doing necessarily anything abnormal other than speaking up on an injustice and something that wasn't okay as it was delivered and described and that we should talk about it more. But uh, apparently um, I was one of the few that did, which was shocking and also telling to me to 
uh, Brittany, for the state I, of, of things. I think you and Sean really said this very well. I mean, that there needs to be, whether, however this plays out, that those moments of saying, no, this is not right, does make a difference. You know, it really does. I hate to say that. And, and it could help, you know, the other people that are peripherally involved as well by taking those moments to step up and say those pieces in the business as well. And it also says, I'm not going to tolerate and I'm not going to support you. No. I'm not going to support these fan bases. I'm not going to support you. If you just allow it to happen, then it says, well, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, it helps okay. establish no. those boundaries, right? Yes. When yes. more people say this behavior is inappropriate or this type of activity or the way that we're engaging is not correct, that just reinforces that social behavior that Desiree was talking about and our, the way we interact with individuals online. The, the more that people, specifically people in power, so that's why we're mentioning men yes. here, they tend to hold the higher end of that power imbalance. It's so important for them to stand in solidarity, which sounds really cliche to say, to say off the hook like that, but it really is speaking up when you, when you have 500,000 followers and you're a man in the book talk space, you have what you say carries weight. And, and the fear of cancellation is less. Yeah, it's so small. They're not going to cancel you. But if you're, a, you know, a female narrator or a female author who maybe has, you know, 400 fans and this is happening to you, if that person says that, that is going to make a difference. The fear of cancellation for me is, is exponential compared to, you know, some of these other individuals. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yep. And it's not just cancellation within the social media space either. I mean, I had to... Just recently with a publishing company, I was reached out and was like, hey, um, they wanted me to do a book and it was dual. And I was like, cool, I need to know who the male narrator is because there are a couple I won't work with. Good and it has know. nothing to do with it had nothing to do with sexual allegations. It had to do with professionalism, with being yeah. responsive, with being on time, with yes. lying about things. I was like, I'm not dealing with that. Mm -hmm. But there is the possibility that I will lose work because of it, because so often the author wants the man. And so even though I am the one acting professionally, the one doing my job, the one not with a history of problems, I'm still the one who's going to be suffering and not taking jobs because I established a boundary versus production companies being like, you're not the first person who said that. Maybe we should keep an eye on this person, but they're not doing that because capitalism, bottom dollar, et cetera. Yep. <laughs> so that's- Unless you go become an be... independent author, right. which is part of the reason- <laughs> I partnered with my business partner because I'm like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to deal with this. I want that that professionalism from the people I work with. And I want my women that I work with to feel just as well represented. So well, I, and, and part of it is too, is that I am lucky enough that I have enough work right now where I can do that. But not everybody feels yes. that way. New, a new narrator comes in, the production company's like, hey, I want to do this. And they're like, well, oh, I've heard bad things about that guy, but I really need this job. I need this publisher. I need, you know, it's like, God, I hope I get it. And I got it. What am I, what am I willing to deal with? And maybe nothing happens that time. Maybe it's a good interaction. You never know. And I specifically set boundaries for people who I know it was a repeated offense. So, and no names were named yet because it wasn't that person, <laughs> but eventually it's going to come up. So, and I just want to point out that, like I said, the more that we see men engaging and supporting the women in these industries, mm -hmm. the more success we'll see. I mean, just look at what Brandon Sanderson has currently done. Uh, we talk about audiobooks. Brandon Sanderson pulled all of his entire catalog. He pulled it from Audible because he found out that the narr that audiobook narrators and authors were not making what Audible offered him as a royalty. They were offering him a 70% royalty share on his audiobooks. And he's like, oh, is that standard? And they were like, well, I mean, you're Brandon Sanderson. He's like, oh, no, no, that doesn't work for me. Thank you. I'll pull all of my books and sell them elsewhere. One full year, all of his material was pulled from Audible. And he just recently announced, if I think if you can find it on his TikTok page and on his YouTube page, he has finally entered into negotiations and they've come up with something that is a little bit more satisfactory. He can't go into details. He says he can't give us the, the exact figures now, but he was working towards increasing royalty shares and fees to, to improve the industry as a whole. And I mean, that's Brandon Sanderson going up against the Zon. So, I mean, but look at what one man who had with a massive power, with power and a massive with platform yes. decided to say, listen, 
this isn't working for me. So you know what? I mean, I'm just Brandon Sanderson, but I'm going to take all my books off your platform and we'll see what we can come up with in the future. Like that's, that's the kind of power I think that men don't realize that they carry and the weight that sometimes that their words can carry in spaces like this when situations like this arise. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's I the think power of empathy and being able to see yeah. that, that impact, even if it doesn't uh, directly impact you in a negative way that you can see that it negatively impacts other individuals in a very broad way and being able to change that. Uh, I think sometimes there's difficulty in many facets of our lives for individuals who have elements of power um, to be able to step in and initiate change that way. But you have to be willing to look outside of your own box and it starts with education. And so yeah. these, all these taboos we're talking about for lack of a better term today, if they're talked about, you understand how it affects an author, how you affects a female narrator, how it affects the fan, how it affects if everybody's talking and no one's afraid, then that understanding is there. And then empathy is there. Then then change happens, you know, in those places where it can. It's the interconnectedness that matters, the subtlety and the nuance that weaves all of that together. It's not necessarily just rugged individualism, right. but we have to understand, and that's why I always talk about it as a part of a community. We are part of a community. The community mm -hmm. has to have a symbiotic relationship to support each other and to carry the entire community through. I'm a firm believer in when you raise the water and raise all the ships in the harbor, everyone benefits. But sometimes that's often challenged with various ideas. But here in particular, with everything that everyone has said, I think that's just been reinforced for me. Yeah, unified front that starts from within um, the actual entity or entities itself. If we think of ourselves as one big entity, that doesn't mean that we can't, uh, that certain things aren't subjective to what we've, you know, how we want to be perceived or our authenticity or uh, autonomy as, as an individual. But still in terms of support, I think uh, the more we can unify ourselves uh, men, women, non-binary in the industry, everybody coming together uh, to have these open dialogues and discussions. Uh, I think the better off that we will be in the future, that everybody could be in the future, to have that, to um, be able to speak up and know that you are supported by your peers, I think goes a very, very long way. I always Agreed. say this one thing. 100%. To my business a colleague, two truths can be this can be pos possible at the same time, because one person doesn't necessarily get along with a person doesn't mean somebody else doesn't. I mean, just because you have a bad experience, I mean, we're all the perpetrators of somebody else's injustice at some point in our life, right? Like we all on our worst day could be judged. But we have to remember that just because one person doesn't have a good moment doesn't mean someone else does and that some doesn't have good business. And so there, there also has to be a component of compassion and understanding, as well as recognizing that not everybody's going to love working with each other too and not everything's going to work out and it's not that that person is a bad person i'm not using the example of the bigger problems that we're talking about but just in general on the day to day and i think it's grace and understanding that we say it all the time but do we practice it and as women we should be really good at this i mean grace is something <laughs> we're forced to do all the time right i mean my husband for god's sakes i grace all the time around there um but grace and understanding and remembering those things. And I, I think that that with fans, with each other, with the business. Perfect. Yep. Thank you, TJ. Anyone else with any final thoughts before we wrap it up? I would just, in the spirit of education, especially of indie authors who don't know any better, I just ask, just please ask, ask it's who scary. you want to cast. I know, but like, if it's you're so daunting. doing audiobooks, just just ask somebody and don't be afraid to say, hey, what was your experience with so-and-so? Because, you know, even if I had a poor experience, I will say, this is my experience. I'm not going to pass judgment on it. I will just say, this happened, this happened, this happened. Or I will say, it's a good thing. This happened, this happened, this happened. But don't be afraid to ask and don't just take my word for it. Ask other authors they've worked with. Ask other narrators. Ask Do your research. Do your due diligence. And things like this will happen because people are more likely to have a whisper network than they are to speak out loud on social media. Um, yeah. 
you know, we we all talk to each other. There's the female narrator pipeline. We're like, hey, so and so did the thing. Just so you're aware, it might not happen to you, but you know. And information, knowledge is power. So don't be afraid Absolutely. to ask. And it's daunting as an as an indie author walking in the door. You're you don't know. You know that Audible can produce. You know a narrator can produce. You know there's independent companies. You know, I mean, what is you know uh, royalty shares? What is per finished hour? There's no guidebook. There's no guide I, I do. that tells I have, us that. I have oh, a guidebook. I have you a guidebook on my website. It. Seriously, because <laughs> like I when I came in, I'm like, oh my God, like I don't even know. And and every author wants a different experience when they're going into the audiobook business. Some want to be very controlled with it, like me, control freak. And some people are like, no, I'd rather just somebody take it over. And it's daunting. And then we don't know, and we don't know about what we should be paying everybody and what's fair and and those kinds of things too. So I just want to bring up, make sure, um, because this is a very consumer based industry, right? Like we're paying for product, we're paying for services, we're paying for output on both sides of the spectrum, read your contracts. And if you don't yes. understand something, red pen, highlighter, red pen, highlighter, and ask and know that contracts mm -hmm. are negotiable. You they can negotiate be. your con. You should be able to negotiate your contract. And if they don't, that's a problem. Red flag. Yes. And also as consumers, there are protections for us. And so understanding what your state or provincial, in my case, hello from Canada, uh, whatever your provincial or state uh, consumer protection laws stay, stay up to date, ask questions mm -hmm. and, and, and be conscious that, you know, you don't have to say yes right away. You have the right to think, you have the right to read, you have the right to question and you have the right to negotiate. If you don't understand and you cannot afford to pay someone to explain it to you, Take the time to do it. You can also ask about the SAG after contract. I also had to do that too, um, and learn what what the rights of my narrators are. I should know that too, as somebody who went and eventually partnered and became an executive producer. What are my narrators' rights? What's the right thing to do for that? You know, what does that mean? And that's important too, not only the authors but the narrators too, yeah. and what those mean and what they look like, and that we should understand them too, so that we aren't taking advantage of those individuals or are the people we're working with are not taking advantage of those individuals. Yes. Oh, yes. And as someone in the comment said, Rat said, ask professionals, ask industry personnel. Mm -hmm. Do not ask an influencer. Do not ask a reader. Do not ask a listener. Yes. Ask a professional. Unless that reader also happens to be like a contract lawyer. Then, okay, maybe ask them. But like yeah. in terms of right. <laughs> ask someone who is a professional in a capacity that you need to know about. Because somebody who listens to audiobooks and does not necessarily know what is in all of those contracts from knowledge every different perspective. Knowledge is power. Yes. Uh, in anything. So always arm yourself with knowledge uh, mm -hmm. as you're moving forward. Um, Leanne, uh, any closing thoughts from you there as we set, sun, set the sun on this one? I think just um, everything that everyone has said has been very eye-opening. Um, thank you all so much. And I would just say, as everybody said, you know, maintain your boundaries. Professionalism is subjective. We can do the best we can. And we just need to hold each other accountable and give each other grace as well as ourselves. Thank you, TJ, for saying that. So important. <laughs> Desiree, any uh, parting comments? Um, I think totally this has been extremely guard. productive. I think this has been extremely productive. Um, I think we need to listen to each other. I think we need to pay attention when concerns have been raised and uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. I do think there needs to be boundaries maintained on both sides of the fence. Um, I think we have the capacity. I know we have the capacity to do better as just human beings in terms of being, as TJ said, compassionate towards each other, giving each other grace, um, being open to dialogue rather than ready for defense. Um, I think that'll go a really long way. Having discussions like we're having here right now um, will go a very long way in, in terms of raising awareness, in terms of um, calming, you know, figuring out common grounds or figuring out where there are disc discrepancies and how they can be worked on. Um, yeah. I don't think I could sum it up any better than that. Um, that's absolutely true. I want to thank 
all of you for uh, taking the time out of your day to be here with us, all of our discussion panelists, um, for sharing your time and perspective with us. And I'd also like to thank uh, Viviana Izzo of Enchantress Bookish Brilliance for her production assistance behind the scenes. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching and participating out there in the audience on YouTube where this is currently being streamed. Hopefully you found this discussion helpful and or informative. I am Sean Crisden, and I now release you to your regularly scheduled life. Go forward, cultivate and share happiness. Be good, do good, and I will catch you next time. Take care, Thank folks. You. Thank See you, See you later, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.